All right, welcome back. Um, you know, we talk a lot about storage in the summit, but you all know in, in the infrastructure stack, it is the compute network and the storage coming together. Um, so our next speaker is going to explore how specifically in this case, network and storage um, are complementing, are coming together in the next, uh, in a generation to come. So please welcome Hal Stern. Hal's the chief architect at the developer business unit at Juniper Networks. So if you don't pay to be a sponsor, you get in between Andy and lunch. Um, make a note of that one for, for future reference if you're thinking about speaking at the show. Oh, thanks, um, and, and, and thanks to Delia and Lindy who um, invited me to come and, and talk a little bit about what we're seeing happen. There was a great question at the end of Andy's talk about software-defined networks and what we see happening uh, in the whole area of, of making the network more malleable and part of the, this larger uh, evolving of, of uh, cloud computing. So what I want to talk about is what's really happening in the world where applications meet the network and where the network meets storage. Because again, I think it's, it's sort of unusual when you, when you talk about storage, almost normally you talk about it as compute. And, and years ago, there were some interesting you know, uh, views on this. Um, I worked for Sun Microsystems for a lot of years. And depending upon who you talked to, you had the view that um, the compute was the center of the universe and storage was a peripheral. And then you went and you talked to people who, who went to go work for the storage companies, and storage was the center of the universe because that's where the data lives, and compute was just a peripheral. But I have discovered in a year at Juniper Networks the real truth, which is the network is the center of the universe, and everything else is just a peripheral. So what exactly does that mean? Well, first of all, we have a lot of lawyers. Um, <laughs> the problem is, and I think this is, a, this is a, a, another characteristic of the fact that developers and deployers are naturally taught not to trust and or like each other which is that applications and networks really don't speak the same language. They, they don't know how to go talk to each other or about each other. So in the, in the user-based world, in the human world, we do a lot of things at the application level to sort of guess what the network looks like. Facebook's Dopwork to me is a great example of this. They're inserting JavaScript code in the page that you load to get a sense of what the network feels like from your perspective. How fast are things loading? How, how much data are they transiting through the network? What are their composition services looking like? And whether you do this in a game server, you do this by looking at who is information, um, or otherwise trying to figure out you know, just exactly what your end-to-end -end bandwidth and jitter look like, there, it's a lot of guesswork that's going on from the application level. On the other side, the networks are trying to figure out what exactly is that application doing so I can better accommodate it. It's moving an awful lot of data around. Well, gee, that could be someone who's using BitTorrent or it could be someone who's setting up an enormous MapReduce job. And maybe both are okay, but usually one's okay and one's not. We try to do application fingerprinting. We look for things that are either signature of a possible attack or signature of traffic that we know is good. And in some cases, we build these additional overlay networks to be able to go partition the data or partition the compute and better attach things together, the net result being that we're trying to get a better view of, of exactly what the application is asking for. So the network, as the, this constri uh, limiting constraint, you know, can get itself out of the way, if you will. The problem with all this is that in the, in the corner case today, what's happening is application view with the network are things like location-based services. You know, oh, okay, I can, I can have my application ask the network for my physical coordinates which is great if you want to write an application to go drive to wherever that device is. I find it somewhat sad that the, the height of technology right now in applications querying networks is producing creepy applications. There, there has to be a better level of detail here. Creeping should not be the, 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 the state of the art. What we really want to do is take the, the various functional players, users who are very much governed by experience, it's, it's latency, it's available bandwidth and it's jitter, it's consistency of the experience. Um, our network, the content that we're accessing, which you know, that's where storage is, is important to this, and obviously the, um, you know, the, the software, the application to tie it all together, and bring things together so that they actually talk to each other and we are able to either drive efficiency when we're cost constrained or drive the optimization of our, use of, of our resources when we happen to be resource constrained. So what's possible here? Well, it, first of all, we can have the network provide better information up to the applications. Again, it's not just holding out your cell phone saying, oh cool, I now have the physical location within a meter of where that cell phone is, 
but rather the cell phone being able to ask the network exactly what's going on. How much bandwidth do I have? What's the typical jitter? What's the, the variation of latency I'm going to see? Where's my nearest content cache server for various types of content? How much upload bandwidth can I get for photos? Um, what's the billing granularity look like? Or what are the billing services available to me for certain services I might want to use? This is the network actually saying not just, hi, here I am, but hi, what's going on around me that I can go consume? And the application being able to send a query, get back some useful data. The flip side of that is the more of those services we create, the more the network has to be intelligent. It has to know what the application is going to ask for. It has to be able to, to notice that um, you want to make reservations or requirements around resources, around bandwidth, um, to be able to protect assets, again, either because they're moving between clouds or they're moving between data centers, um, and to disambiguate things that are well known and well understood and things that, that actually have to fit into a hierarchy of priorities and processes. The problem with networking is, is anything that involves today class of service or quality of services, you typically have a certain small number of classes. And you, know, you see this happen all the time when you do project management or, or feature prioritization. Every feature, of course, is the most important. Otherwise, you wouldn't be working on it. So it's very hard when you're asking to self-select to really disambiguate and figure out what needs to happen. The more you know about the application and the more you can apply some business intelligence to it, the more I think you can make you know, much better informed and much more data-driven decisions. When we talk about software-defined networking as part of this overall view of the programmable network, the goal is to make those resource allocation decisions much, much more informed, to actually take information from the network and from the applications and decouple the things that would normally happen in-band on the network into a place where we can, we can drive some more software and some more intelligence into the network. And this is why you care. Again, why am I here speaking at an open storage summit? It, first and foremost, to, to paraphrase Cory Doctorow, it's because developers love to tinker. And historically, that tinkering always happened at a very low level. We're building better connectivity, we're building different storage protocols, we're, we're investigating file systems. I really do believe now that, that the tinkering is going to move up the stack. And we're going to be able to tinker from a storage level with a different variety. And, and, uh, and what we're seeing is a, a much broader view of ways of accessing storage. The flip side of that, then, is we also have to start tinkering with the network that connects it all together. And um, I'm reminded of um, back in 1985, Sun introduced NFS at the Usings Conference in Dallas. And at that time, it was, it was almost a bit of heresy. I mean, you're going to access data over a network? And, you know, of course, today you can access an entire movie's worth of data over the network, you know, unless you're a Netflix customer, it appears. Um, and <laughs> thank you. I was working on that all morning. <laughs> um, and th there's good and bad news there, right? We don't even think about it now. You know, I mean, you're sitting there watching a YouTube clip on your phone. You don't think about the fact that there's a radio network, a backhaul network, a, a couple of core networks along the way that you're touching. You may be touching five or six different networks with very, very different physical media or non-physical media in the case of radio. And it just works. So where exactly can we start to add this intelligence? And again, I think that the, if, I, if you go back a few years, and certainly, look, you know, ZFS probably being the, the most recent contribution here, the tinkering in the storage area really was around how do we get, how do we organize the bits on the device? How do we get them off faster? How do we make them better, safer, easier to find, more redundant, and higher performance? file system organization. Assuming, though, that this is really one server talking to a pile of disks. It's a single system view. And Andy just talked about scale and cloud scale at two to three or, or four orders of magnitude larger than that one single system. So the abstractions that we use here and the places we think about tinkering here, I think really don't apply anymore. And the key thing that's missing is not a discussion of POSIX semantics versus CRUD semantics. It's the fact that when you talk about file system engineering at a very low level, you're not really talking about things that have cute names and fuzzy animals. And if you think about the storage abstractions that people are talking about today, the cloud scale storage abstractions or the network scale storage abstractions, they are things that really hide what's happening at the server to disk level. What they're presenting to you are CRUD semantics. So it's not you know, read, read, write, open, close. It's, it's create, read, update, delete. Things that exist across multiple instances, across multiple servers, with an awful lot of scale, petabytes of scale, different domains of performance, different domains of reliability. But the key thing here is every single one of these emergent storage paradigms 
embeds at least one network. A lot of cases, they embed multiple networks. There's one between the client and whatever the, the, the service node is. It's providing that, that the high-level service, the Hadoop service or you know, a MongoDB server. And then probably a, another one or more set of, of networks that actually connect the servers to the storage devices. If they happen to be integrated, obviously the answer is, well, it's just one big network from the point of view of your application. But when we talk now about tinkering with storage, we have to naturally assume that the network's going to be a large term in the equation. And we better figure out what to do to make that play well with our overall performance or user experience or reliability or predictability equations. What this means is that the larger we think about storage, the even larger the networking problem gets. And I need to worry now about things like cost and transit models for moving data between a private or a public cloud or into a hybrid cloud model. I really have to worry about how I'm going to enforce security for data that's in motion between those two. And again, this is a combination of encryption and firewall rules and understanding what's expected data motion and what's possibly someone, you know, where I'm under attack or someone else who's doing something that, that's, that's uh, having a negative impact on the, the class of service or the service level agreement I've put in place. I worry a lot about things that color user experience. Congestion, latency, and jitter. I, I live in New Jersey, make all the Jersey jokes you want. On a summer Sunday afternoon, driving back from the Jersey shore, uh, you're sitting in traffic. And of course, as soon as you're sitting in traffic on the Garden State Parkway, the first thing everybody else who's not driving in the car does is they take out their phone. And they bring up Google Maps and try to figure out where the traffic breaks up, or they try to look for alternate routes. And the next thing they do is scream about just how bad the your insert name of your carrier here is, because everybody's competing for the same amount of, of backhaul bandwidth at that point. So there is no reasonable mechanism that's in place there to, to look at subscribers, users, and to, and to put a ceiling on usage and a floor on usage to ensure that everybody's getting a fair share. You have nice, gentle degradation. On the other hand, it's a computer science problem. We've solved that one before. We know how to make things degrade gently. We know how to deal with things that are, are massively over-constrained. It's been you know, the staple of a virtual memory system for 30 or 40 years. So some of that general purpose compute knowledge now has an opportunity to come in and start to color the network. And this is where we can tie together things at multiple levels. It's not just what we look at at a course level by asking the router or switch to tell us you know, tell us how many packets went through or tell us, you know, what the route table looks like or tell us about the topology, we actually have the opportunity to start asking questions at a very low level, down at the packet level, to start doing deep packet inspection, to match protocol headers, to look for specific users, um, to look for things that might represent application signatures, and to truly understand what the nature of traffic is and use that as, as an informing process, as, as going much, much deeper in the network data supply chain. And what this means is that the pendulum of smart versus dumb networks is swinging very, very, very far back into the smart network world. And it, it, I'll give you my, my rough buckets of, of network evolution. Um, in the pre-internet age, which I defined as ending when AOL dial-up disks started showing up in the supermarket, um, because that's a point at which, like, you, you know, you, it was very exciting to go into a hotel and say, you can hook your modem up right here to the phone line. And you, know, you didn't have to sit there and try to splice it in yourself. The, the clients at that time were pretty dumb, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of the, the dial-ups were PCs. But the, the clients that most people thought of that were you know, telephones. Okay, There's not a whole lot of intelligence in there. You know, in, in free cell phone, for people who remember things that had round dials or push buttons on them. And if you were lucky, if you didn't have a, a trailblazer, you could get you know, two and a half kilobits a second. And what the, the greatest thing in the world was you could get connected. And along came the internet, and the network suddenly became dumb. It's just TCP IP. Just move the packets along, best effort, next hop. The routing protocols will take care of it. You just do, as long as you plug your routers and switches together, life will be great. And you can do it at 10 megabits a second, and it was really cool because you had immediate access. And what we're seeing now is that the immediate connection and the reliability and the, the predictability of that very, very smart network with dumb endpoints and the... Um, Ability to carry lots of types of traffic, to connect many, many different kinds of things, um, and the intelligence of the endpoints come together now, and now we have this converged core network. And converged core basically means, gee, those telco guys did some things that were really cool. We should pay attention in the world of TCP IP. That's, a, a, that, that's again, a year at a networking company, and you learn to understand the, the code words of converged core. Uh, we have, again, much, much faster access to a lot more things. The defining factor here, though, is experience. The more you talk about people being on their wireless devices, iP you know, iP iPads, iPhones, whatever, it's experience driven. So class of service, quality of service, congestion, latency, jitter, all matter. 
They all produce beach balls, and therefore they produce bad user experience if, if they are not handled properly. And what this means is that it essentially, to quote you know, some of my favorite Jersey sports characters, it's deja vu all over again. What we're seeing now are announcements by the carriers that they are putting APIs on their network. Come and write applications to program to our network. Again, take the creepy out of this about location services. What this means is they are opening up views into how exactly they move data on the network. They're giving you a view into the control plane of their network. This, I think, allows us to create all kinds of new consumption patterns and constraint patterns. It allows us to add some programming intelligence to the network. It means we also need a lot more intelligence about what's going on. We've seen this happen before. As soon as you start to put APIs on top of things, their usage changes. We saw it happen, again, with POSIX interfaces on Unix systems. We saw it happen with generalization of how you talk to storage devices. We saw it happen with the browser. As soon as you can get any content accessible via HTTP, the types of content and the amount of content just absolutely exploded. And we saw it happen with mobile, which is as soon as you made all those things available to a mobile device with a browser on it, Again, you, you had an explosion, not just in the types of data, but the types of applications that were written. As we start to put more and more programmability into the network, I think what will happen is you'll see, and to quote Pradeep Sindhu, a lot more stochastic nature of the traffic. Not just bursty in, in space, you know, how much traffic's being handled at the time, but very, very bursty over time as well, because we can't predict what those applications look like or what they're going to be doing. And let me sort of tie this together. And, and again, dig back a little bit. Um, if, you, if you were too young to remember the 90s, the music stunk, and the computer technology was just getting there, and we didn't really have good networking. That's the 90s in three sentences or less. Um, but before that, Peter Deutsch had written down seven, his seven fallacies of distributed computing, and James Gosling added the eighth one about the network being homogeneous. And I think they're still true today, which is no matter what kind of distributed application you're writing, and it used to be just we thought about things that were RPC-based. You know, we're going we're to write something that's going to be a grid application, or what we call today a grid application or cloud application. Anything that is distributed, which today subsumes almost all storage applications, you will eventually make one of these mistakes. You'll make a bad assumption about reliability, latency, bandwidth, points of control, or security. And I will argue to, to sort of add on or contradict a little bit what Andy said, I think cloud computing makes this harder and worse. Because the more we virtualize, the more we say, oh, it's easy. Just spin up a virtual instance. You need storage, just go ahead and grab it on, on uh, Amazon Web Services. You go ahead and, and go grab it from your favorite cloud storage provider. It's, and it, again, the time to get the first byte across is, is very, very low. The cost to getting the first byte across is very, very low. But what happens now by hiding some of the details and assuming the network just works, we're, we're inviting, we're leaving the door open now to make some of these bad assumptions about what exactly the network's doing underneath there. And again, what I think it does is it forces us to consider the network as a first-rate player with compute and with storage and figuring out how exactly we're going to build these, these very, very large petascale data centers, as well as deliver their content out to the billions of devices that are looking for it. How do we do that? Well, I think we do it, I, I like to think of the problem really in, in, in three axes. There's a time variable to it here, which is networks give us data at a particular point in time, you know, who are the users who are, at, you know, who are online right now? You know, how many packets are going through this firewall right now? Um, we can get a lot of real-time information. That is, we can, we can make decisions about what we want to, to drop or if we want to redirect traffic or we want to quarantine traffic or if we want to make a, a, a change to the state of a router. I want to take the, the data flows coming in and move it somewhere else. And we can look at things over very long historical periods of time. Um, we think about what we want to go do with that. I want to annotate it. I want to marry it to topology. I want to marry it to some service definitions. I basically want to be able to, to create information out of that mountain of data that I have and use that to go drive this process of deciding exactly what the software is going to do to change the shape of my network. And I can think about this in, in a, a couple of different domains. Just thinking about this, for example, in a security meets cloud world, if I think about um, when I'm making decisions, am I making them at design time, in real time, or over the historical perspective, sort of down the, down the y-axis and across the x-axis here, what exactly am I doing? Am I analyzing things? Am I modeling them for, for, for you know, building future reference models or future resource allocation models? Or am I taking action? You see this set of applications pop up. Everything from how do I define my security posture, how am I going to lay down some rules of what I, want, what I define as good and bad behavior, all the way through to I'm going to go build a model for cloud cost based on the spot cost of compute or storage, 
based on my network cost, which tends to be, one, again, ver one of the very large cost factors in looking at using a cloud service, and my own cost of securing the data and accessing it, which, again, can include everything from, you know, compute cost of doing encryption and decryption to the management cost of when people forget their passwords or their passphrases and can no longer access something that they happen to put into the cloud. This allows me to start building much more dynamic models of what exactly I want to do over my network. So to go back to the question of what's exactly happening with software-defined networks, when we talk about making the network programmable, what we're seeing is this, this dichotomy of networks informing apps and apps informing networks happens when we start to decouple some of these classic control points away from the hardware. And that is, the things that you would try to do by, again, by guessing at the application, by writing your own overlay network, by, by trying to put in some, some instrumentation, we can actually add network level applications that take advantage of all the data coming off the network, as well as the ability to go change the state of the network. And those decoupling control points happen to be in the areas of policy, of content or resource placement, of looking at the actual f filtering or flows as how am I gonna steer my data through my network and how do I improve the user-based delivery or experience? Again, better user experience, better traffic through the network so I can, I can better manage my resources, much improved storage impact in terms of content placement and content delivery, and then the overall decisions around policy to decide who gets to do what, when, and why. And you think about this, I, I tend to think of this as a closed loop system, which is your network assets draw off data, you consume the data, generate some value, decide to take some actions, impress them back on the network, and around you go. Brief commercial, this is actually a platform that, that my, my role at Juniper is to be architect of this platform. This is something that we've built and are continuing to add to it. Um, it's, if you, if, 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 the old joke used to be if you had you know, five programmers who wanted to go solve an interesting network problem, you put them in the room and the first thing they do is they built, write an app server. And today, I think you take five programmers, you put them in the room, the first thing they do is they write a framework. So this is our framework built on an app server to go build network applications. Um, and it's built on top of, it's built on top of Java EE. The, you know, the, the low level technology here is not rocket science. The abstractions we provide, how do we look at networks? How do we look at topologies? How do we give you accessibility down to the network elements? That's where there's some interesting computer science. Essentially though, we, we have this you know, spun up, have an Eclipse front end to it so you can sit and write Java code talk to our REST interfaces and be able to get access to all the devices on the network to start to A, extract some of that data, look at those events, and add that at this top level, add this layer of intelligence to take those, those control functions, decouple them, and start to add um, a finer level of control and a, and a deeper level of control over exactly what's happening you know, to the traffic. Let me give you an example. I think, you know, a, a, a lot of words here. What, what's really going on? Well, let me take the simple example of I need to get content from my favorite URL. And we know, you know, there are a lot of companies that do this today. There are some companies that that's their sole business. And today, one of the metrics that's in use largely is distance. Well, if I, if I send you to the cash server closest to you, it has to be the fastest. Well, if you happen to be at the Super Bowl, and Randall Stevenson from AT&T had a great point when he gave a talk earlier this year. He said that, on the AT&T network during the Super Bowl this year, more data left than went in. People taking pictures, people tweeting, people updating Facebook. And that to me is amazing. That there's, I would figure it's everybody there, you know, people are not checking their email or looking at things. They were broadcasting all 80,000 of them, including the probably the few thousand that didn't have seats. So distance in that case is a really, really bad metric because it's going to be the most congested, the most heavily loaded, and the most over-constrained. So what I want to do is I want to make a real-time decision to find a better answer. Again, a real simple problem. I have a mobile device. I took a picture of, you know, here's me and my dad at the Super Bowl. Upload it. It's a storage problem, right? Well, it's not. It's a networking problem. Because what happens, I say, all right, where do I go to either get or, or place this content? And normally you go off and you talk to some call them gently a DNS partner. You have a URL, I want to resolve the URL to some physical location. Well, rather than having that happen once, I'd like to have that happen much more dynamically, where I will ask the network, what's closest, what's fastest, what's most current? What has the best upstream bandwidth to wherever I happen to be going, whether it's Facebook or Tumblr or Flickr or my own email system? And I can actually rely on the content caching servers there to provide some additional levels of information, again, to better inform this. So what happens is when the URL comes in now, I can do this 
spike, looking at the URL, making a, a choice to rewrite it um, and, and redirect the content dynamic or statically once because I've actually modified the URL in the, in the app, or I can do this dynamically. That is, look at the traffic coming in, in the line, in the network. Oh, gee, it's a URL. It looks like the URL for content. Let me go make some decisions about where the, the best place is and then rewrite the URL and give you back an answer and send your traffic on its merry way. And again, I can do this basically once, say, oh, you, know, you may have thought the answer for you was Amsterdam. It turns out the answer is Chicago because that just happens to be the, next, the, the best end-to-end -end network path to get to your content. And again, there's a storage problem. There's a storage problem that happens you know, all the way on that side, right? But the perceived storage problem is what happened between the user making the request and the time the bits actually arrive. And that's be where the network has become this, this large term in the equation. It's not just something we assume anymore. And we have the ability to go control the flow of these requests, of the data, of all the control information, again, at a general purpose computer science level, not at a, I, I need to understand this you know, incredible alphabet soup that lives at the network level. There's another example is, what if I know I have to be setting up a large, I want, I want to set up a, an enormous Hadoop run. And what I really need is network bandwidth to distribute all my data into the HDFS sets first for however long that's going to be. And I really don't want other things interfering with that. When I'm done, you know, sort of life can go back to normal. So, you know, basic, basic large grid setup problem. Well, what I'd really like to be able to do is, is reserve the bandwidth. And again, same thing happens if you want to talk about doing a a point-to-point -point video conference, or anything else where you know you want to have pretty much you know, good access to the network or invitations to staff meetings. So what happens? Well, um, I'll ask for a path. And the network's going to tell me a little bit about what's available, when it's available, again, what the size and shape of that, of that pinhole will be through the network, and then go and, and you know, set it up. The trick here is you want to be able to do that without actually having to know what's happening on the network. You don't have to know all the intermediate hops. You shouldn't have to ever say MPLS if what you're really interested in is Hadoop. Okay, again, cute fuzzy animals versus lots of, of alphabets. The fuzzy animals will always win because that's, that's the thing that people tend to speak to as general purpose developers. Again, you would use this for any number of things, whether it's thinking about how you're going to actively place ne uh, network resources or place large data sets, um, manage high performance compute things, or do something like setting up a, a short-term cloud burst, a hybrid cloud. The biggest problem with hybrid cloud is you have to get your data there, then get your data back. And taking the network out of, out of the way as a constraint is a big win. Here's another example. This is a, 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 a company we've been working with um, called Joule X. And they have an application that allows you to um, build an, literally a heat map, an energy heat map of your network by querying the individual network item so what they do is they start on top of our platform, they build up a list of every device that's managed in the network, then they know a mapping on that device, here's the RPC I call on the device to get its current power consumption. So they'll build the network map, they build the topology, they start querying. What would you use this for? If you know that an entire floor of a building is unoccupied, go turn the power off to the switches. There's absolutely no reason to keep those, you know, especially using power, there's no reason to keep those things powered on if there are people not in the office. You happen to know by looking at the network what the traffic looks like. And now you have the ability to go change the shape of the power consumption, treating this as a network management problem, not as a facilities management problem. And the more I think you look at, at things that involve sensors or smart grids or smart cities, they all at some point involve being able to go talk to these individual producers of data. And in the, in the most general case, this, this view of networks informing the applications starts with this, all this data I'm going to be able to retrieve from my network. Obviously, the things like geography, where are things physically located? There's subscriber information. You know, when you when you log on to the, the you know um, you log into network service in your hotel, or you 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 you, you turn on your, uh, your your cable modem at home, and it negotiates you know with the the, the aggregation layer up at the network uh, at your service provider's um, head end you're essentially establishing yourself as a subscriber. A lot of information about load or utilization or topology or traffic engineering. And what we're seeing now on the networking side is this larger number of protocols being developed that carry traffic data in them. So it's not just telling you what the shape of the network is. It's not these uh, boundary protocols that tell you here, you know, here are the networks I can get to, but tells you here's the network I can get to. And by the way, here's roughly what it looks like. It's, it's Google traffic for the network. 
here's where it's dark red, and here's where it's yellow, and here's where it's green. Go make some decisions based on, on that information. And there's a set of services that are spinning up now that we see that you'll be able to go query, you know, so your application can make better decisions both about where to go place their services as well as what to go do there. And again, there are a lot of things here that, that start to fill into the, um, I, I think, you know, on the content and, and storage crossover space, whether it's content routing or content distribution um, or thinking about security in the cloud. The bottom line is, you know, historically we thought of, I think, networks as, again, you know, it's sort of this, you, you, you feel that you fix it, you forget it, it, it goes away until it breaks. Uh, there's an enormous ingredient branding opportunity here. You know, it's, it's like BASF, you know, they don't make the golf ball, they make the golf ball better. Well, the network doesn't make the storage, it just makes the storage better. And the more you understand about what's happening there, I think the better the overall, from a developer point of view, the, the better the overall storage experience is, whether it's latency or congestion, um, or thinking about, as a number of people have proposed in research, that the future is really content networking. That is, it's not so much what we're accessing, or who, or when, or where, it's what are we getting, how are we consuming it, where are we putting it away, and how we're gonna handle it over long periods of time. All those things necessarily include networks. They all necessarily have um, interesting data that's produced about them, and they all have an opportunity to, to be shaped or to be optimized. And the bottom line on this is, uh, again, to, to paraphrase from Steve O'Grady uh, at Redmonk, you know, if you're good at doing distribution, you're generating a lot of data. You should use that data. Networking is, is just distribution. You just have to be di distributing things that live on disks. So I'll tie this together. You know, think about the, you know, if you, if you happen to be, let's say, a, a connoisseur of big data, you're really, really good at writing MapReduce applications. Um, and what you want to do is write something to better figure out where to go place copies of a particular piece of enterprise content. Again, there's enterprise content management applications that will help you with the indexing and the filing and the archival and the ownership and the, the editorial flow, but they don't really tell you where you should go put the bits on disk and where those things should live on the network. And partly that's because it's a, it's a highly dynamic thing. The training video that everybody has to watch in the next two months is gonna be hot for a while. Probably the 24 hours before the deadline when everybody has to watch it is the hottest. How many copies of it should you have? This is one that Facebook gets well and, and does a very, very good job with it. If you, if you go back and read their coverage of um, how they handled election night 2008 and what they did with their red state, blue state map, they just kept spinning up copies of that. So they knew that the more and more people were gonna be looking you know, to get that information, we were gonna be including that as something that was one of the first things they had seen. Um, they became a primary conveyor of that real-time information. The way they scaled it was just making sure that the network you know, had enough copies of it easily accessible to wherever they happen to be generating profile pages from. So I'm gonna think of this in network terms as I'm gonna take all the data I have, events, logs, flows, anything else I wanna do by writing code to, to go better you know, extract data from my network, tag it, filter it, join it, oh, no, somehow enrich it or annotate it. I can either feed it off to a real-time analytics engine, something that's gonna look at this in real-time and make decisions, or I may feed it off to a, a, a batch process, a Hadoop or something similar that's gonna go look at this over that, that historic or that long period of time. I may use that to go match it up against business constraints. I know something about my billing models, my rate plans, my users, my subscribers, my expected behaviors. And what comes out of that is a set of state updates. So we talk about you know, software-defined networking. Software-defined networking is not just, ooh, I can write an application to go change the forwarding cable on my switch. Oh look, I can make the packets go through a different path. You have to do that coupled with some intelligence. There has to be a, a, a set of data sources that actually drive what's happening there. And it's not just protocols like OpenFlow, it's other things that understand traffic optimization, traffic engineering, as well as some of the heavier weight configuration things. It's part of the, 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 the phrase software defined networking gets thrown around a lot. I, I see that as part of this larger problem of making the, the network behavior very, very data driven. This is just one example where Things here might happen in, in real time and other things might happen over long periods of time. They're equally important. And this is, from a protocol view, what it looks like, which is there's a set of APIs that you use to talk to devices. Um, some Today, some basic control and management APIs. So you think of the, these things like routing protocols, things that update the control plane. Um, NetComp, which is a protocol for sending config files to devices. And then there's a set of emergent things like OpenFlow you know, which is a protocol that basically says you can take the control function, the thing that modifies how 
you know, how packets get forwarded or processed on a, a, a router or a switch and run it elsewhere. You, you can do that decoupling and run it on another piece of equipment. Again, how do you make that decision? I'm hoping you make that decision based on all this other information you're pulling out of the network. So you, you then have at this network-wide layer another set of APIs to say, let's go look at what's happening on the network. How do we get data and events and device models and topology models out so we can go build those you know, applications that, that are much, much more network aware? And obviously, when you, when you, you know, that's sort of the think of this as the enterprise view. When you add in a service provider view on the, on the, on the left-hand side of this picture, they all have you know, some number of existing systems, things that, that actually do provisioning and control of the network. What they want to be able to do is, is to tie these things together, to add a, a set of richness. So it's not just what the typical service provider would do. Okay, I'm going to be able to provision faster. But also, now that I've done some provisioning, or now that I know some things about my network, I can better optimize the end-to-end -end behavior of it. That's the, the cool part, right, is that, that there's, there's a lot of uh, facility that's emerging. Um, the, the good news, and again, you know, being, a, being a, a, a computer science person by training, is that there's still some really, really hard problems. So I think people say, oh, wow, okay, you, know, you now have protocols you can use to go um, change the behavior you know, dynamically of a, of a switcher router. What's left? Well, what's left is actually doing something intelligent with it. And this is where the problems get interesting. As soon as you introduce more networks, privacy, security, trust become harder. And you have to worry more and more, what do you do with that traffic that's coming in you haven't seen before? Is it someone who's subject to clipjack spam? Is it someone who's accessing a site that, that you, know, you should have blocked in your firewall, but you didn't because your firewall rules are only updated once a month? What do you do? And what makes it harder is we're trying to get more and more precise at the same time we're dealing with exponentially more data. It's very, very hard to be precise to the individual URL or the individual file or content level when you're talking about petabytes of data. So what happens is things that we have always sort of dismissed as, as less interesting from a computer science perspective, estimation, approximation, accommodation of experience, those things that are a little squishier, they become more important. You know, something as simple, it's seemingly simple as trying to optimize how you carry your network over a set of existing links. So, okay, I know what my demands are going to be point to point. I know what capacity the links have point to point. Just go optimize it. Well, it turns out for some value of just, you can't do it. It, it reduces to the bin packing problem, which, you know, it's NP complete, can't be solved. And it's good. We not like, like the fact it can't be solved. It helps us, you know, with things like cryptography continuing to work. On the other hand, we're running into these problems where the massive amounts of data, the massive scale, and the complexity are, are helping us run into some limits of computer science. So what do you do? You approximate. We clearly know that traffic runs over networks. just doesn't do it optimally. So it's not like, okay, problem can't be solved. Don't solve it. No, it's, let's get more creative about how we are going to solve it. The tremendous opportunity I see in this is that people who come um, into networking without a networking background, me you know, included in that, now have an opportunity to apply the knowledge you have, whether it's graph theory, compute theory, um, user experience optimization, apply those to networking problems without having to be networking experts. And we can do this across a very, very wide dynamic range of time domains, from things that happen in the sub-millisecond level, when we're talking about packet forwarding or, or you know, ephemeral state updates, all the way through the things that happen in the days to months you know, to years level, when you're looking at historical data or trending or behavior analysis. So that's my reach information, um, some information about what we're doing from a developer perspective. If you're interested in our software developer kits for the device, um, that is to be able to go write code that you run on the route or the packet forwarding engine, or the Juno Space SDK, which lets you write you know, code on top of this network layer. Um, we have our own Twitter account. Uh, You'll find pointers there to a lot of stuff that we've talked about where we, we exposed a lot more detail on this around Java 1. Earlier today, we also announced that we are making our first OpenFlow client application available um, to people who are SDK partners. So again, if you did the whole area of software-defined networking and being able to use OpenFlow to change the behavior of an edge router is interesting, we now have a, a, a client that speaks OpenFlow. So you, to OpenFlow shim sitting on top of our SDK that actually touches the hardware underneath it. So if you have some code, say, great, I'm, gonna, I'm dying to go write a routing protocol. If you are, there's a computer science program somewhere who, who wants to have you, I'm sure. But if that's the kind of thing that you say, no, this is, there's actually a very cool way of thinking about this in terms of content networking or storage networking, we've exposed that as well now. And again, it's just you know, part of, I think, this, this growing trend. Andy talked about 
the OpenFlow Summit that was last week at Stanford, some of the things that are going on with OpenStack. Um, I think you're, you know, it's likely you're gonna see a lot more uh, research, a lot more work, and, and hopefully a lot more you know, effort on standardization in this area. It is really interesting to see what happens when you take people who really understand developing code from a very broad perspective, and people who understand networking in all of its rich you know, protocol and, and signaling glory, and bring them together so they can, they can have intelligent conversation. I think there's a, a lot of, of good work that can get done. So thank you. Questions? I realize, again, the, the other fair question is, you know, isn't lunch next? So yes, lunch is next. <laughs> so I will handle questions before lunch. Thank you. Well, I guess I'm going to pose another software-defined networking question. One thing that I think, at least to me, it wasn't clear from your presentation is the replacement of infrastructure that it takes to support OpenFlow and SDN. And um, how much of an impact is that going to make? Uh, I mean, like, like what's, what's the switchover going to be like? And also, where does the line get drawn between where you're doing your SDN definitions and then the rest of the world? Because there's always this tr uh, transition between you on the rest of the world, and maybe somebody else is doing SDN. Well, Can so you make that clear? All right, so, so, so let me start from the beginning, which is, you know, what's a transition like to hardware that, that, that does or doesn't support OpenFlow? Our hardware, you know, some elements of our hardware today support OpenFlow. That is, they, they have the ability for you to manipulate the, um, the table, you know, the, the appropriate forwarding tables through software. Um, obviously, there's a, a tremendous range of hardware that fits into that. So I think that, that there's a, almost a, 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 a pre-question to that, which is what would you use OpenFlow, I mean, I'm gonna separate OpenFlow from software-defined networking. What would you use OpenFlow for today? It solves some set of problems. It does not solve every set of problems. It has a very limited vocabulary of, of what it can do, how it can match, how it looks at tables, and, and how it updates the hardware. So I think the first question is, if you say this is interesting, this is interesting, you know, I wanna be able to go, to go really look at the network at that, at that level, at, the, at decoupling the control plane, and the things I want to be able to do, I can go stretch an overflow, then you know, you're looking for hardware that supports it today. And again, our, our part of our announcement earlier today was, hey, you know, we happen to have a, a toolkit available that will let you go talk to you know, a set of our routers that are, are effectively enabled by this, this OpenFlow client side. So I, I'm not sure if there is a transition. I think it's more of a mental transition of, I want to take something that used to just happen transparently in the network at the control layer, and I'm going to pull it out and do something explicit myself with it. The other question of, um, you know, the larger question then of, of programmable networks, I think is it's more than just I want to be able to go change what the flow is through the network. I think it's much more I want to be able to go get data from the network to make these more informed decisions about higher level things, not necessarily how I'm going to, you know, again, I think there's a lot of network engineering that goes into how you want to steer data through the network, how you want to establish paths, but there's also a lot of higher level coarser grain things like where do I place my content? Where do I place my caching services? You know, where do I, you know, how many, how many points of ingress and egress do I need that are, they're not all the way down at the packet forwarding level. They're much more at the, I understand bandwidth latency products. I understand, you know, total traffic that's gonna get dragged over available bandwidth. And I'm gonna make some placement decisions that way. And I, again, I think that that's why SDN, software defined networking in particular, I think, Right now, a lot of the current things I've seen written about, it tends to be like, oh, let's talk about open flow. But the larger issue of making networks programmable, I think, includes a lot of other things. It, it, it's just one part of it. So, again, I think it's going to be a, you know, it will be a, a uh, it'll be a transition. It's going to happen over time, like all things do, as people, as people realize you know, what the abstractions are, how they want to use them, what the value is in using them, and, and you start to see applications written. Um, a data point I can give you is a year ago when we first started talking about writing code to the device, we had about 100, 120 or so developer partners. Today we have about 500 people who've picked up and are using our SDK. So that's, you know, again, it's still, you know, three digit numbers, not, not five digit numbers, but to me that's, that's a sign that there, there's, there's an, up, an uptick there and there's none right there. Other questions? Yell it out. Yeah, you, yeah, you can you can yell it out. Yeah, I'll repeat. I'll paraphrase.
where you guys see working maybe even you know within your your up and down your product line with other vendors up and down their product line so that like with uh, we do web hosting so that you know not only could our routers and switches communicate you know to our mm -hmm. to our providers that we're you know our connections to their network and where you're going to make sure that this kind of uh, software is made compatible with you know and also with, with the fact that you know we're going to be involved with the client server so, so questions about how far across the product line does it go and how interoperable does it mean re, would it ma remain between vendors? I think you're going to see things like, and, and the good thing about the networking business is that pretty much from day one, it, it's necessarily been a multi-vendor world and interoperability is just the lingua franca. You, you either interoperate or nobody else talks to you on the network. And it's like no one ever invented a fax machine that didn't talk to other fax machines. It would be very lonely. So if you want to be able to play here, again, I think you know, if you if you want to look at from an open flow perspective, okay, now you have a, a distributed um, control protocol you could use. Yes, it would be great if it, it talks to all the implementations. You have the usual interoperability testing. Um, in terms of up and down the product line, I think it's a question of, um, it's a couple of things. One is, how do the abstractions in the spec match what you could do in the hardware? And some things are good fits and some things aren't. The other part of it is going to be, um, you know, just uh, you know, what's the what's the return? There's something that just makes sense and something that don't make sense. Uh, again, I think it's it, the good news is you, you start with a you start with an anchor point, and and you give people the ability to go start working where there's going to be interesting return on. Again, there are a couple of uh, you know, a couple of good research projects going on. If you were up at, at Stanford last week, I, I know there were a number of people talking about things that they are doing and types of applications they're looking at that are you know making the 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 packet flow network a little bit more malleable. But that tends to be at the you know sort of edge to edge. It's not necessarily all the way you know, uh, you know all the way down on, on the you know what you could do it on a you know on a, a piece of consumer equipment, for example. Now, yeah, again, and then not that that would ever make sense. I mean, if if, if you, <laughs> I won't go even go there. But uh, in, in terms of you know how high or how low you go, I think that's that's something that as people start to see the return, I think as as we start to get more developers who are attracted to this space because the abstractions are easy to use. That we'll, we'll see exactly what you know what the, it, what sense it makes to uh, to continue to, to grow those you know, to grow where the where it's implemented across what very clearly a, a lot of interest in making things interoperable. End of the day, though, the bits still have to flow. So you know, you're talking about interoperability at a different level of, of control, not at, not at the at, at the you know at the data plane. Any other questions? Okay, thanks, Sal. Thanks. That there's, was great. A, there's a chicken waiting for you somewhere here. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Shotkey, I don't know where the lunch is. You might want to just yell it out there for me. Got it. Lunch is outside. Yeah, lunch, lunch is outside. Yeah, lunch is outside, and we'll just regroup here at 1.30. So this hall is going to be broken down into three sessions. So the breakout sessions we have today are cloud, virtualization, and uh, HA. So... We'll meet here back at 1.30 then. Thank you.